Alright, so tonight we're in John 3. Third. Yep. First, second, third John. And I will read it. This is our greetings. Um, this letter, and this is my wife's Bible, so the pearls and all the stuff. This letter is from John the Elder. I am writing to you, uh, Gaius, my dear friend, whom I love in the truth. Uh, dear friend, I hope all is well with you and that you are as healthy in body as you are strong in spirit. Some of the traveling teachers recently returned and made me very happy by telling me about your faithfulness and that you are living according to the truth. I couldn't have no greater joy than to hear that my children are following the truth. Dear friend, you are being faithful to God when you care for the traveling teachers who pass through, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church here of your loving friendship. Please continue providing for such teachers in a manner that pleases God. They are traveling for the Lord, and they accept nothing from people who are not believers. So we ourselves should support them so that we can be their partners as they teach the truth. I wrote to the church about this, but Diotrephes, who loves to be the leader, refuses to have anything to do with us. When I come, I will report some things he is doing and the evil accusations he is making against us. Not only does he refuse to welcome the traveling teachers, he also tells others not to help them. When they, and when they do, he puts them out of the church. So, dear friend, don't let this be a bad example. Don't let this bad example influence you. Follow only what is good. Remember that those who do good prove that they are God's children, and that those who do evil prove that they do not know God. Everyone speaks highly of Demetrius and does the truth itself, as does the truth itself. We ourselves can say the same for him, and you know we speak the truth. I have much more to say to you, but I don't want to write it with ink and with pen and ink, for I hope to see you soon, and then we will talk face to face. I <coughs> speak with you. Your friends here send you their greetings. Please give my personal greetings to each of our friends there. All right. So this was written around 85 AD. Uh, then about 95 AD, John is a uh, saw the Patmos where he was, writes the book of Revelation. And around 100 AD, John passes away. So we'll start with the first one. And John, second John and third John, they say were written about the same time. Or at the same time. Just because of the content of the letter. If you read both of them, I believe that that is true. You can't have John 3 without John 3. Um, this letter is from John the Elder. So, you know, the term elder is used for older, obviously, he's fairly old at this point. And he's the last living apostle, last living disciple of all with Jesus. And, of course, the term elder means elders in the church. Um, you know, seems one, I'm one. Um, spiritual leaders, if you will, of the church. <coughs> I'm writing to Gaius. Gaius. Uh, my dear friend, whom I love in the truth. There's four or five gases, gases in uh, the New Testament. Um, this one, uh, we don't know, it doesn't really tell us if he's a pastor uh, or a lay person. But obviously, uh, John's got an endearing love towards him. He's probably one of the people that uh, uh, John brought to the Lord. In my love and truth. 
in the truth. We know what the truth is. Truth is a book right here. That's what he's talking about. The truth. That's the truth. If you're not, don't know this book, don't know Jesus, then you're not walking in the truth. So dear friend, I hope all is well with you and that you are as healthy in body as you are strong in spirit. And I popped out me. You are as healthy in body as you are strong in spirit. So, you know, I've listened to some stuff and they speculated. I didn't pick up on that, but they said, well, hey, uh, Gaius um, might have had some physical problems. Um, but John's like, hey, you know, your spirit is strong. You're good there, spiritually speaking, and you're, you're on fire. You're good. But physically speaking, I hope all is well. I hope your body is as healthy, I hope you're as healthy in body as you are strong. And then you know, I started thinking about this and how important it is for us as believers to be, I mean, we're in a battle. We're soldiers. We're warriors. We need to be physically fit. And I'm looking at Steve as, you know, we talk about examples in here, and there's some, all, some examples of godly men, gay as being one of them. Steve's obviously an awesome man of God as well, but he's an awesome example of what is we need to be physically. We need to be physically fit. And, you know, there's years where I haven't been, but I really do watch what I do on exercise like I should. Herpes. Uh, but uh, what we put in our bodies is essentially, I mean, this world is fallen. All right? The food industry, the people who rule this world really and truly, you know, they do not have good intentions for us. Let me put it to you that way. So we really have to be, you know, if I go out and I know drinking two two-liter cups a day is going to make me sick, this is my temple, the Bible says our body is our temple, you know, well, what happens when I do get sick because of that or some other circumstance? Now, obviously, there's genetic things that we can't control. Um, you know, Pastor David being one of them, Pastor Kevin, they didn't do anything to cause that problem. All right, that's an attack from the enemy. We live in a fallen world. Um, but there are things that we can do physically. And, you know, I, tell, I, I pray all the time, God, if you want to continue to use me physically, please do so. And I can't go pick Carl up that's physical. If I can't do that, God will provide another ride. But I want him to use me. Um, and if I'm physically messed up, you know, that limits what I, how I can serve the Lord. Not that we can't serve the Lord if we're not physically. Obviously we can, but... You know, we are warriors, and just as, you know, like Pastor David said, just standing up here teaching one hour is like eight hours of work. You go work eight hours, and you come up here, and he used to do it three times a day. Still don't even know how it's possible, but, I mean, that's, that's, it is physically demanding, especially in this place. I and mean, when you're going out and doing the things that we're doing, we get extra scrutiny from the enemy, and, you know, he is going, that's one of the things he's going to try to attack you, is physically. So, and another thing I was thinking was, so, are you, like Gaius, are you maybe not physically fit in the body, but you're strong in spirit, or right now are you physically fit and your spirit's not as strong? And that's for each individual person. And I would say, you know, you know, straight up, physically, this is the best I've been in a long time. You know, but I've been spiritually stronger. So, which would I rather be? I would say, thinking the things that I've seen spiritually and the excitement that that is, I would say I need to head back toward that. I, I won't boast, don't get me wrong, but being truthful. Um, so, for and like Paul, you know, Paul said, hey, Paul didn't want to walk around with what he had. You know, the Bible says he asked three times, God to take this away, and whatever reason God didn't. But, hey, look how he used Paul. Check it out. So some of the traveling teachers recently returned and made me very happy by telling me <coughs> about your faithfulness. And that you are a living, you are living according to truth. So he's 
walking in the way. It's following Jesus. And that's, you know, again, I'm assuming that you know, Paul probably, this guy probably came to Jesus uh, through Paul. And you know, there's nothing greater than seeing someone that you've raised up walking in the truth. Your child, your family members, your friends uh, walking with Jesus, seeing the change in I could have no greater joy than to hear that my children are following the truth. So, there's been ministers sharing the gospel that are traveling around. Back in the day, you might have had an in, you might not have one where they were. And the body provided for themselves. They shared with each other. And I was listening to a teacher. A lot of the ends back then were ends of prostitution. And I might make some people happy today out there. You know, we know how there's a lot of, I think, like 50%, unfortunate number, 50% of the pastors that are born addiction today. It's numbers that I've heard. So they might be happy to say, hey, I'm going to it. Did a prostitution is 50%. I've heard that number several times, not just once. Yeah, 50%. Um, but, anyway, that's what that end represented. So they were like, hey, you know, they wanted to open their houses up and just like the life groups. Same thing. Those that have life groups, hospitality, and they open their homes up. This is our life group. And we're here at church. But, you know, a lot of these guys and as I was thinking through this, you know, I look at Jim Rouse as just you know, a shining example of a brother that will open his house up. To people, straight up, I wouldn't have done it. You know? And I look at him and you know, I'm supposed to think Jim is my example. Uh, there was a guy, and this had to be from the Lord. I couldn't even remember his name. God brought it to my attention. He stayed at, John, at uh, Jim's house. But what was his name? John. Couldn't even remember it was John. So one day I was riding around in traffic so we're going to work. God said, go to church. I said, alright. So I go to church, pull up, cafe. Here's this old dude sitting in a wheelchair all burned up. And uh, you know, he had, had been burned up. And I uh, hopped out and I said, how are you? He said, not too good. Said, now I know I'm here. So we took him in and uh, Got him a Bible, took him to the altar, shared the gospel with him, uh, got him some clothes and some food, and uh, somehow or another, he ended up at Jim's house. And he was a tough dude to love. I'm going to tell you that right now. He ended up at Jim's house, stayed with Jim, I don't even know how long, months, yeah. until he get into uh, up in Mount Airy, some type of retirement home. And then right at the end of his life, he was in the hospital, and uh, we went, and me and Gwen, and several of us, and went in there and sang to him and prayed for him that one last time. And then, like, maybe, uh, I think he texted me, and I didn't get right back to him. I think the next day he was, he was with the Lord. But I'll never get that. He was, he was tough. But again, Jim opened his house up. But back in the day, you know, today it's not so much. Um, but we still, even today, um, you know, you'll see right here it's talking about the Lord's workers. Even today, when we tithe here, uh, we're, I, I think I asked Pastor Miller, it was 10. We support 10 individual uh, missionaries. And then we do gospel for Asia. We send out to numerous countries. Anyway, um, I was, John was just excited about this. So, dear friend, you are being faithful to God when you care for the traveling teachers who pass through. Even though they are strangers to you, they have told the church here of your loving friendship. So, this report got back to John, and he was like, you know, hey, that's encouraging church here for what you're doing. And most of the, a lot of the churches were just in-home churches, just 
like the life homes. Um, there were no big churches like we have today. For they are traveling for the Lord, is what missionaries do. And they accept nothing from people who are not believers. So I was studying for this. Uh, I think it was Jay Vernon McGee and another pastor said this, and I was like, all right, well. And, and they said, you know, not the people that don't believe give stuff to the church, but God really doesn't want their money. You know, God wants them to have a relationship with Jesus. And the church doesn't need to be run off funds for non believers, it needs to be run off of funds from believers. Um, and I also thought about Pastor David. What? There you go. You're talking about somebody that traveled around. That was Pastor David for I don't even know how many years. He had that traveling music ministry and traveled all over the United States. And I remember hearing him tell a couple stories here and there about people opening their homes. I'm sure a lot of people did. And I do know that when people come in, like Dennis and some other people come in, Pastor David puts some up in his house. And he's got one can actually put people up in. Um, but that's an example. So that's close to Pastor David's heart. Please continue providing for such teachers in a manner that pleases God. For they are traveling for the Lord, and they accept nothing from people who are not believers. So we ourselves should support them so that they can be we can be their partners as they teach the truth. It's just like I was talking about the missionaries. You know, if we tie here and also individually we can go out and and uh, support other ministries as well. But I know corporately, we uh, that's what we do. We're all gaining, helping in that mission to spread the gospel uh, more so than we could do ourselves. Just like supporting this church and supporting you know, Pastor David and Cross the Bridge Ministries. I could never, not that I couldn't, but you know, God's not got me in. Most of us not in that position to go out and share the gospel with hundreds of thousands of, or millions of uh, but yet we can support the person that he has set up to do that. Um, and of course support the organization, Gospel for Asia, and all these other organizations that go out and you know do the I mean do really do the hard work, let's be honest. You know, I mean they're risking their lives in some of these countries to share the gospel today. I wrote to the church about this, and here we comes diatrophy. One that we do not want to be. I wrote to the church about this, but Diotrephes, who loves to be the leader. So here's a dude who is not walking with the Lord. He refuses to have anything to do with us. When I come, I will report some of the things he is doing and the evil accusations he is making against us. So. Some speculate like when Paul comes, they're going to talk about it, and then he's going to go talk about it with him. You know, because Paul's going to come, like, I'm coming, and then I'm going to confront this guy. And I'm assuming that's probably what happened. Um, now, I can say that there's been some diatrophies in this church. I don't think there's any here now, but there was in the past. Especially when I came in early on, um, you know, my diatrophies moment was I missed him. You know, I just passed away, went to his funeral last week, and I missed his son's wedding. Why did I miss that wedding? Diatrophies in the church. So that day, Pastor Dave had a call meeting of some craziness. I don't even remember his old in leadership. What I was about, but uh, you know, I was mentioning something about church bill or whatever, and uh, so I didn't know if I was going to have to get up there. So I had to miss my cousin's wedding to be here to back up Pastor David over a Dodge of Fees moment, yeah. you know, and another Dodge of Fees moment that we can all remember uh, the couple that went on camera, you know, for the excommunicated from Facebook or whatever. Alright? <laughs> that was some diatrophy. There's a lot of diatrophy going on. There's not one. There's a group. And, you know, they're gone. Praise God. But, and I can also say this. 
of the dioxin fees that have been here, it is not going well for them. It's not, you literally are taking on God. That's not where I want to be. You know, when you cause division in the church and you're not walking with God and you're trying to separate the church, it's, you know, it says it right there. I mean, you're you're coming against the Lord. I don't want to be fighting with God. I want to come against God's anointing. And these people, for whatever reason, have gotten fooled and come against God's anointed. And I'm telling you, I mean, it's not where you want to be. So, here we have Diotrephes, who loves to be the leader, refuses to have anything. And he's talking about John, the last of the dude that walked with Jesus. And you're you're going to tell him that, no, I know better? That's, uh, yeah, that's Satan. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you. That's, that's Satan coming against John. I mean, that's crazy. The last living apostle, the starter of his church. This guy's, and I'm not saying this guy's a pastor. Um, Diotrephes, uh, I think in the Greek means Zeus. But it, it was an Aristotle. It, it was basically for a hierarchy of people in the high, rich people. That was the name. So it wasn't a, uh, wasn't a normal name. Um, so this guy may have been prominent in his own mind. And maybe he did have a lot of money. Um, but yeah, so this guy's coming against the last living disciple who actually walked with Jesus and started the churches in Asia Minor. So he is making some evil accusations. The evil accusation he's making against us. Not only does he refuse to welcome the teachers, so he was like, nah, hey, you know, we want to come and share. Nope. You're not coming in. I'm assuming, you know, he's leadership in the church. He is a pastor. You're not coming in my church and share. Which there is, you know, you do have to be careful about who comes and shares in the church. This is not an example, but you do. Pastor David is very careful about who comes in and what people share in church, what even what literature you can leave out in here um, as well, like from other ministries or whatever. Um, you know, highly vets, because he doesn't want somebody coming here and busting out false teaching and then having to go back behind and clean the mess. Um, but this guy's stopping God's anointed from teaching. You come into church. And to top that off, he also tells others not to help him. So you can't come in here and don't help him. And then if you help him, he kicks you out. So this church right here has gone way south. So I got a feeling that John's fixing to come to the clean house like Jesus. Physically, he might be up not old enough to do it, but I'm sure there are some people that can do it for him. And here's John. Dear friend, don't let this bad example influence you. Follow only what is good. You know, I know Pastor Day put out a prayer request. You know, he feels led to share the gospel, and you know, he's getting beat up for it. You know, when I see this, that's, you know, John's saying, hey, don't let these people influence you. you know, just keep doing, following the truth. And keep sharing the gospel. And I can, you know, I guarantee you today, uh, you know, probably throughout history, but as you're coming up in America, it was no big deal to share the gospel. Probably 17s, 18s, 19s, and probably we started in about 1960, 70. 80, 90, 2000. Now it's, you know, you can get dangerous. You know, so we've gone from being able to go out and share our faith to, wow, you're going to pay for it. You know, and, and that's not going to get any easier either. And one day we might die for it. But we know what we're going A lot of people are down the court today around the world. It's not here yet. But follow only what is good. Remember that those who do good prove that 
that they are God's children. And that those who do evil prove that they do not know God. So, a lot of people today
weapons of, you know, he killed millions of people, or yeah, this was a bad game. And most people at a funeral, yeah, you know, even pastors you get up there, and they never, it's, yeah, I was the biggest drunk, did all kinds of crazy things, and they'll still find some way to talk good about it, even though there was no good in it. But I mean, truly, you know, truly, you know, what do people say about it? And I, I can look around this room and at the people that I know, and I can say, hey, that's a good guy. Hey, I want to, I got straight up, you know, I don't want to, you need to be like him, you want to follow him. Because we've all, regardless of our age, uh, there are always people that look up to us. You know, whether you be an old man or a young man, watch it. <laughs> <laughs> people still look up to Mr. Fisher, even though he's that tall. <laughs> but in stature, in stature, in spirit. So, and it concludes with peace be with you. Uh, your friends here send you their greetings. Please give my personal greetings to each of our friends there. And Steve, what verse are you in? It's 13. It's 15. It's 15. What you just read is 15. And I'm looking at a Greek text. That's uh, great. Uh, somebody got King James. I'll do. I got New King. Which one more? Yeah, just read it. That's cool. Uh, New King says, uh, I have many things to write, but I do not wish to write to you in pen and ink, but I hope to see you shortly, and we shall speak face to face. Mm -hmm. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. Mm -hmm. Peace to you. Greet your friends by name. That's a good way to end it. So, you know, I was fascinated by, you know, John, the Gospel of John, John 1, 2, and 3, were just, you know, really incredible books. And, uh, you know, I was blessed by, by reading and the things that, you know, go on in the church. You know, like I said before, um, you know, I look at the, the church today, the church that we have, and, and you know, I don't see those that diatrophies. I just see the, the Gaius and the Demetrius. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to be proud to be a part of that. And I, you know, I know Pastor Andrew is he's looking back, and you know, sometimes you know, the Bible says God separates the wheat from the chaff. And, you know, some people, you know, we're a smaller fellowship now. A lot tighter than we used to be, and I believe we've got just a really good fellowship.